Few buildings in Dubuque compare to its enormity. Few buildings scrape the sky like a needle. Few buildings stand as high and proud, a beacon for us, lingering below. Few buildings offer such famed beauty, inside and out. Few buildings are as rooted in rich history as that of St. Mary's. On an orchard purchased for a mere $3,000, occupying the entire block north of 15th Street, a magnificent structure was erected by a group of German Catholic immigrants in 1867. When St. Mary's began, it was a congregation of only 40 German families that had banded together to form their parish. At the time, there was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment in the country, particularly in the state of Iowa with the Germans because the Germans were viewed as they didn't speak English, so they weren't as able to assimilate as the Irish were. So the Germans really kind of did have a hard time when they, when they came to this area because they were viewed as outsiders. So they built a beautiful church with a soaring steeple that would really show people that we're in this country and we're thankful that we're here. A building, a declaration, a memorial, an invitation to Dubuque that would be drawn up by one of the most unlikely of architects. His name was John Mullaney. He designed the cathedral here in Dubuque. He designed the New Mallory Abbey in Piasta and some other buildings that no longer exist. He was an immigrant himself, but the interesting thing is that he was an Irish immigrant. He worked under the direction of an architect by the name of Augustus Pugin. And Augustus Pugin is known as kind of the master of the Gothic Revival style of architecture in the mid-1800s. Um, you will see many of his designs in Ireland and England and Australia, and almost all of them have a very ornate spire that really punctuates the architecture. The clock is a hallmark of Gothic Revival design, and when you look at the Big Ben clock in London, and that's something that John Mullaney designed into the spire. Brick is not necessarily a hallmark of Gothic Revival, but it is actually a trait that's common in German Gothic Revival churches. Germans actually preferred brick over stone, one because where they were in Germany or Westphalia or Bavaria, they didn't have the stone available to build stone churches. But the other thing too is when you're in colder climates, brick is something that is a little bit more forgiving with the freeze and thaw cycles. And so you want a building that you can maintain easier than a stone building. So I think that's why John Mullaney was such a perfect architect for this building is because the Germans of this congregation would have been familiar with Gothic Revival as a style because they came from Germany that had a lot of very grand Gothic Revival churches. But John Mullaney didn't refrain from adding unique character, style, and artistry to the design of this masterpiece. This building is unique in the fact that it has two different styles of vaulting. When you look down the center aisle, um, it has what we call fan vaulting, and that is kind of the curvilinear style of vaulting. And that comes from what's called the perpendicular style of Gothic architecture. And that was mostly in probably the, the late 1300s, early 1400s, in, mostly in England. And that's not very common to see that here in the United States because, you know, it's a very difficult thing to design. Here in this church it was designed in plaster, but in Europe it would have been all masonry. On the side aisles, we have what are called groin vaulting, and that is more kind of common what you see in Gothic churches. When you go into the cathedral here in Dubuque, you'll see that it has that style of vaulting. So it's, it really is interesting to see why they decided to use the fan vaulting on the center aisle and the groin vaulting on the side aisles. And that's something that we just don't know why the parish made these kind of design choices. 
The design of St. Mary's Church cost about $97,000 to bring to life. That's a pretty daunting task for anyone. And so it just kind of puts it in perspective that it really was quite a unique thing at that time to build a church like this. And when you look at the photos of the period, you know, there are photos that show this building in Dubuque. It just towers over everything else. And it really makes a statement. A statement that would be heard by the surrounding community and eventually bridging ethnic divisions. Within probably 15 years, the parish had kind of exploded in population so that it was 300 families. And there are records of numerous baptisms during that period. So you see in a lot of the parish directories that it's almost entirely German until the early 1900s. And then you start to see some Irish names mixed in. You start to see some Italian names. There were some Polish families. There were some Bohemian families in the parish. It was during these early years of expansion that St. Mary saw the magnificent interior decoration truly blossom. The first decoration of this church was in 1878, and we really only have one photo of what that decoration looked like, but the way it looks, it was just as decorated then as it was now. Different design, probably obviously different color scheme, but it was a very Victorian type of a decoration. But we do have pretty significant documentation to what is kind of considered the significant renovation of the church, which occurred in 1912. The interior decoration from that period was designed by a firm out of Milwaukee called the Erhard Brillmeyer Company, who were architects and designers for churches. And they had designed a lot of the decoration. But for some reason, the, the Brillmeyers did not actually execute any of the decorative painting. So they kind of partnered with a local artist and painter here in Dubuque named Joseph Walter. And he kind of executed basically most of the artistic painting, if you want to call it. However, one piece of the interior was in fact painted by a member of the Brillmeyer family and it would become a staple of the building. The daughter of Erhard Brillmeyer, who was the head of that architecture firm, her name was Clotilde Brillmeyer, and she worked for the company and she did a lot of their mural painting and interior um, decorative painting. And so she was hired in 1912 to paint the Assumption mural, which stood over the altar, and it's 35 feet tall. St. Mary's Church was dedicated as St. Mary of the Assumption, so it was only fitting that there would have been a mural this size dedicated to the Assumption of Mary, you know, directly over the altar. The naturally recurring theme of Mary is expressed throughout all areas of the church. The windows were installed between 1913 and 1916. They would have been ordered in 1913. They were obtained from a company based out of Munich, Germany, and it was the F.X. Zettler company. F.X. Zettler was world-renowned for his design of this style of window, and this style of window has come to be known as the Munich style of stained glass windows. You take colored pieces of glass, and then you paint the design details on the glass, and then you fire the glass so that the paint becomes enameled and it becomes adhered to the glass so that it's permanent. So FX Zettler Company was very popular both in Europe and the United States, mostly for Catholic churches because uh, Munich and Bavaria was, was a Catholic part of Germany. The design theme of the windows is scenes from the life of Mary. So, it goes from her childhood, and the first window that you see in the northwest part of the building is the presentation of Mary. So it shows Mary going into the temple with her mother and father and the rabbi there giving Mary her blessing. The last window on the northeast side is what I guess we call the falling asleep. Under Catholic tradition, Mary didn't die, she fell asleep, and then she was assumed into heaven. And so the assumption is the, the mural, so that's kind of the last progression of Mary's life. We had a stained glass conservator look at the windows, 
And it's his opinion that these are some of the finest FX Zettler windows in the region as far as their ensemble goes. He said it's the most complete ensemble of Mary-themed windows that he's seen. Many aspects of St. Mary's decoration were so grand that parishioners deemed its beauty irreplaceable, even as it began to show its wear. In the 1950s, maybe the paint was already looking tired, a little old, but they actually go through a process of actually repainting the interior. But what I find really fascinating is for that time period, they actually copied the original 1912 period as part of their repainting campaign. And that was a very uncommon thing to do in the 1950s. I mean, by the 1950s, you get these modern ideas of what churches should look like, less decoration, kind of this modern idea, just like with architecture and other design. And so St. Mary's didn't do that because they wanted to stick to their ethnic German background and they wanted to give honor to the people that had come before them and had spent so much time and money to make this place the beautiful, glorious place that it is. However, through a meticulous discovery process, it was uncovered that St. Mary's German pride was tested at one point in its history. I excavate and dig at the historic paint layers by uh, creating what we call in the industry exposure windows. And what it means is we're looking to create a window and expose what was maybe historically there. And so by mechanical and chemical means, we remove layers of overpaint to try to see if we can find signs of earlier decoration to kind of reveal how far the 1950s scheme deviated from the 1912 scheme. Uh, one really interesting uh, item in particular is the written descriptions underneath the Stations of the Cross on the nave walls where it is known that the original text was in German because this was a primarily German Catholic church and they wanted to see if it still existed underneath and so we did some exposure windows to find it in we were fortunate enough to expose part of it, but what's really fascinating is, is that knowing a little bit about history from that time period, after the First World War, many German nationals in the United States were kind of embarrassed about their heritage because of what had happened uh, during World War I. And so you get this Americanization of a lot of their culture, and it's very apparent that even early on, they painted out the German text in English, and and maybe it was around that period where it was happening in other parts of the country as well. But the road of hardships for St. Mary's did not end there. The fire happened in January of 1976, right after Christmas. It started actually where the, the Christmas crib was. And so the fire began and it devastated that part of the church, but luckily someone had noticed that there was smoke coming out of the steeple. And so then the firemen were able to come in and, and put the fire out, but it did damage the church uh, substantially in that part of the church. But enough damage to merit pretty significant amount of work and cleaning. So we're fortunate enough to have a lot of the original contracts and proposals as far as uh, the repairs from the fire. So it seems like most of it was cleaning the existing decoration, repainting only areas that were directly impacted from the immediate location of the fire, which was small little selective areas. And they're pretty specific about some of the areas that they repaint. I think they spent close to $300,000 to repair the damage. And again, that was another opportunity for the parish to say, well, you know, it's just, it's just cheaper for us to, you know, take paint rollers and just paint over everything. And they didn't do that. They cleaned and they meticulously touched up places where it had been damaged that kind of gives you an idea of the ethic of the, the parish at the time. A strong-willed ethic of togetherness that was held even in 2010 when St. Mary's closed. There was a lot of controversy when the parish closed. You know, there were people that felt that uh, this parish should not close as, you know, the most beautiful church building in Dubuque. Um, why does this parish have to close? The reality is that a building like this needs to be maintained and a Catholic parish is supposed to be self-sustaining 
And just at that point in time, there weren't enough people to sustain the operation of this building. And it is a tremendous treasure for Dubuque. And regardless of, of your thoughts of whether the parish should have closed, everyone I think agrees that this building needs to be saved. It's kind of important to get this understanding about this history. And so people get this understanding of why the changes were made, when they were made, and it helps to tell the story. A story featuring the lives of thousands, including one of St. Mary's beloved associate pastors whose sacrifice would be heard by the entire nation. One of the highlights of the National Register nomination, one of the reasons why this building is so historic, is its connection to Father Aloysius Schmidt, who uh, as chaplain in the U.S. Navy was the first American chaplain to die in World War II when he died in Pearl Harbor in a ship sank. So, you know, not only are we honoring the buildings, we're honoring the legacy of the people that were really the life of this parish. With so much history embedded into one building, the issue of its condition naturally comes into play. The current scheme is in pretty good condition where obviously it wouldn't merit repainting it. So what you're really looking at if you walked in today is basically the last vision of the space, which is primarily from the 1950s with a refreshening up in the 1970s after the fire. But what's really fascinating about the interior in here is that the 1950s tries to really emulate uh, the 1912 period. So it's like by looking at uh, decoration from the 1950s, you're really getting a part of the history. With this well-preserved time capsule standing vacant in downtown Dubuque, the question then becomes, what to do with the beautiful monolith? It's our responsibility, being in the field, to educate the others as much as possible about the process, what we're finding, because in the end, then they, they come to appreciate kind of what's happening. And then with all that information, I'll look to put together a report which will kind of first give information about the history of the interior, the finishes and the changes with that information assess the conditions, where things are at now, and then make recommendations of what they should do as far as restoring and preserving it, conserving it, you know, all these different elements that might be incorporated as part of the final project. The interest level was pretty good. I mean, obviously for people to just come out to hear uh, some boring people like us talk about historic buildings and paint chips and everything else, I mean, obviously shows that there's a, a commitment in the neighborhood. And so we really want it to be a neighborhood resource again. We want it to be a community resource. We also want it to be something that people can be proud of. You know, we, we want it to be something that people are comfortable coming to and, and they feel safe. We want it to be a catalyst in redeveloping the neighborhood. This neighborhood has so much history to it. It's a story that you get that you don't get in any other part of Dubuque. A story now at a crossroads of endless possibility for a building that has united a community for over 150 years. And now, that very same community stands united, working on a new vision to restore the impact of St. Mary's and ensure it continues to reach the heavens. The building has always had the imagination of people in Dubuque, but I think that people didn't really know what to do with this place when it was no longer a parish. And so we're looking at redeveloping it as a cultural center or as an event center. The interior of the church will change very minimally so that you, know, you still get the effect of the space, but that it will be used for concerts and for conferences, for receptions. It would be a perfect space for classrooms, for daycare. Um, we're hoping to develop a culinary arts program. There could also be some space for retail, anything that, you know, that would get people into this building on a regular basis. And so now it's fun to see people coming in here and talking about what could this space be? You know, what could it be used for? And see the beauty of the space and just kind of take it all in. And so it's really exciting to see that people, you know, really share the passion that I have and that I developed over the years for this project. You know, it really kind of is a contagious thing when you come in here and you see it and you start to find out a lot of the history of this place. And it really does kind of catch people's imaginations. In today's world, you couldn't build a building like this. I mean, it just wouldn't be possible. That's why it's so important that this building stays on the Dubuque skyline, is it's irreplaceable. 
You know, you could never build another building like this in Dubuque. I just would never see it happening.